Pierre, artificial, artificial intelligence, like operations, is in everything these days. We, you know, from the way we work to how we go about our daily lives. Just look at what Ike had just told us. There's an AI at the back that's an analyzing all that security information to find those holes. Exactly. But the biggest question now is, is artificial intelligence being used ethically? Right? Oh, I don't yeah, know. Was, and that's what we're going to discuss in the panel today. So I'm going to drop you out and we're yep. going to pull in our panel. There we go. I love technology. All my friends come and join us. So quick around the room, if we can, just introductions. We'll start with Sarah. Hey, I'm Sarah Bird. I lead responsible AI for the cognitive services. And next up, Venki. Hi, I'm Venki. I'm the head of product for Azure Cognitive Services. Hi, hey, everyone. I'm Mira Lane. I'm the director of Ethics and Society, and we work with uh, Venki and Sarah on deploying responsible innovation across the system. And uh, hey, I'm Josh Lovejoy. I lead design for Ethics and Society. Now, this conversation that happened during Ignite caused such a stir that we had to grab another 30 minutes. A lot of IT professionals are interested in participating uh, in the adoption of artificial intelligence at their organizations and the services that they use. But because of the fact that IT professionals are always seen as reactionary, they're never, be, they're never able to put their best foot forward to properly help incorporate artificial intelligence. And the whole discussion around ethical AI use makes it so that this opportunity allows for IT professionals to not be the gatekeeper, but to be the heralds of the proper use of AI. So start, we're gonna start in this panel, I'm gonna start with Venki. Uh, you've been with Microsoft a long time as a, as a PM, and then following your trajectory, you're now the head of uh, product, uh, the products for Azure Cognitive Services, where you lead a portfolio of AI-enabled cloud container services. We deliver world-class AI in speech, vision, language, and decision categories. When did responsible AI become fundamental and important to engineering? Uh, great question. Uh, so, you know, my goal as a head of product is to sort of first build great product uh, that is really help, helping our customers. And the way we sort of know we are helping our customers is by driving adoption. And so, as you mentioned, uh, sort of adopting AI at scale is a big endeavor, but also brings up a lot of interesting questions around sort of, you know, how do you sort of use the response? How do you use it? And then again, uh, how was it developed? Like what, what was done? So there's a lot of questions, uh, both in the technical community as well in society at large. And so to me, there's only one right answer, which is we need to just dig in and start uh, doing the work so that people can really trust the AI that we're building uh, such that they can use it in their solutions. So, and that's interesting is, you know, we hear a lot in terms of the use of AI. I I've actually heard the term rub a little AI on it and you'll either save money or you'll make money. It it's, it's an interesting, you know, premise that people are putting forward with the ethical use of AI. What is the, the strategy here? What is the, you know, the, the work towards that organizations and IT professionals should be working towards? Sorry, was that a question to me? Oh, sorry, yes, back at you, Venki. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, anybody, this is panel discussions, but anybody can jump in. Um, is anyone else wants to take, take that? Sorry. Well, he here's the thing, right? So, so in the inclusion of AI and a lot of organizations, we see that, oh, you know, I'm going to add cognitive services to my solution. I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, we work with the Missing Children's Society of Canada to enable artificial intelligence to deduce when uh, a specific sentiment was carried out on conversation in social media between a child uh, and, and the possible abductor. And there was a lot of interest from outside groups outside of uh, Missing Children's Society of Canada to incorporate facial recognition, which uh, at the time, we said no because, from an ethical standpoint, permissions of capturing said faces and what have you was, you know, something that we wanted to be very cognizant about. In terms of the adoption of AI and and specifically ethical use of AI, what are organizations looking towards, or, or what are they starting to gleam in terms of the adoption? I can take this one actually. Um, I think, as Vinky was saying there's there's really kind of multiple steps that we need to think about and that an organization needs to think about. And so one of the first steps is 
at the beginning when we want to think about the impact of the technology. Right? Who is it going to work really well for? What are uh, failure modes that we would want to avoid? And we want to do an exercise where we really understand all of the potential impact so that we can design the technology to achieve all the benefits that we want, but avoid those, those cases that would be uh, very, you know, we'd all as creators be very unhappy uh, to see them happen. And so the first step is really thinking about people, thinking about this impact. The next step is thinking about how we develop the technology, we have to develop it responsibly. If I'm the one building the model, I need to make sure that I have that diverse training data and that the model actually works well in different scenarios and works well for different groups of people. And so part of it is the way you actually build it. There's a bunch of considerations you need to take into account during your development. And then as Vinky was saying, it's not, it's not enough just that we build it responsibly. We have to empower people to use it responsibly. And so we need to uh, use tools like transparency notes and deployment guidelines and documentation to help people better understand how to take this very exciting, powerful technology and use it successfully in their context. And so uh, we're also looking at how to do technological innovations and pieces to enable that responsible use. And so we really have to think about the entire flow and. And um, I think that's where you know all organizations are going to need to to move towards is really thinking about each of these phases when they're they're looking to either develop AI or or adopt it and use it ethically. So Sarah, having a lot of IT professionals in the audience today, they're often seen as the enablers of end user access to this data. How does the data fit in the responsible AI story? Yeah, data is a, you know, a huge part, right? Data is <laughs> is kind of the lifeblood of AI. It's how we we power everything, and uh, it's very hard for a machine learning model to to learn something that isn't in the data, and so it's a key part that uh, we found right in practice that you have to think very very deeply about, and it's not it's not just about getting as much data as possible. It's really about making sure you have the right data, that you're intentional about the, the data that you're using to learn from. Right? And you think about how this data was created, um, the topic I already touched on before, which is does the data have the uh, diversity that we need in it so the model can learn the right things? Is it really the right data for this problem or is it that it was data collected in a different situation and it may not really reflect what we, we want to learn in this case? And so uh, a key piece is that we want to be really thoughtful and intentional and have a huge understanding of the data that we're, we're feeding into our system for it to learn from, because that, that's gonna have a huge effect on uh, what comes out the other side. And to be honest, it's, it's more than just the data. As we're building this system, we really need to make sure we have the right information as, as part of our design and part of our process. And so I would love to hear Josh talk more about how we really get that, the right information. Yeah, for sure. It's, um... And one thing we probably all can agree on is like what matters most at the end of the day is whether something actually works for people, you know, and better yet that it delights them when they interact with it. And if it doesn't, like, why not? Um, you know, the reality is there's no way to know perfectly if something's gonna work for people. But the best step forward is to try to walk a mile in their shoes. You know, who are the people that are actually gonna use this stuff that we're trying to build? And what context? Um, and what kinds of jobs are they trying to get done, right? So that's kind of the heart of what user experience is, you know, UX research and design. Um, we try to connect the dots between what a technology is capable of doing and the ways that people, we think, will benefit from using those technologies and those capabilities. Um, one example that, that comes to mind, um, it's, I would say, not as sensitive as the facial recognition one with kids that you brought up, but it's sort of in a similar vein of, of, of that technology and about how generalized use sometimes kind of leads us down quirky pathways. So I worked on this product um, that was trying to add AI functionality into camera, like into a camera, into like photo taking. Um, and the goal, the user need was like taking better candid photos of familiar faces of people. Um, the initial version was throwing us some, some weird unexpected results. 
um, it just wasn't getting always consistently great shots of people. And so we, we actually built kind of these debugging, these custom debugging tools um, that helped us simulate. Um, we could turn certain models on and certain models off. Um, and when we dug into this one classifier, the person classifier, um, what we noticed was it was getting really interested. We use words like activation in AI, right? So it was getting activated by hair length as a proxy for women. So even though we were trying to look for familiar faces, candid photos, we were actually getting a lot of shots of men's faces who typically tend to have shorter hair, but women who on average have longer hair, we were getting shots of the side or back of their head. Um, and so what we actually had to do was specifically ignore that model and then double down on our data collection efforts, just like Sarah was saying, where we actually, uh, we needed to specify equal representation across both gender identities, but more importantly, because the, the goal of the app was to try to take photos of faces, we needed to make sure that always in every piece of training data, there was a shot of somebody's face well framed. So from an IT pro pro's perspective, Benki, how do they fit in the whole process of responsible AI? Yeah, um, they perform a critical role. I think, uh, you know, and I think about the work that we did in uh, sort of getting AI sort of even developed and deployed at Microsoft. Uh, there are so many questions around responsible sort of development and use. Uh, it really is sort of uh, impressive the amount of skills you need and how, given how new the whole field is, that, you know, the realization that almost no one knows all the answers and everyone knows parts of it and they have clear points of view, but sort of the, there's no process, there's no policies yet in place to just simply answer the question easily. And so what we've done, uh, and I think what really my guidance to IP pros is sort of get all the experts together. So there's experts in technology, there's experts in policy, in legal, uh, in design, uh, bring them together and sort of really sort of have a sort of safe space to sort of talk through what what are you trying to accomplish? And again, as Josh and uh, Sarah mentioned, like what is the problem you're trying to solve? And then how does AI fit in? And then what are the issues that you want to come up with? And you know, in our personal experience, we have sort of this ship room where we go through these questions, and it's just impressive how many different perspectives there are. They're all right, but they're all sort of different parts of this of the story. And so, really, want to synthesize. And IT Pro has a really great role to sort of like. Uh, facilitate this synthesis so you can actually say like look this is what we're going to do and here's why we're going to do it and there is it's not perfect it's, as Josh mentioned it's not going to be 100% right but we feel like we understand the problem enough and then second you know we know we have the systems in place to learn from it and so I think the learning again is a critical part that's going to come up over and over again yeah and you know and it's even um, bigger than just pulling the groups together as Venki saying we've had to also build a team that has all of these expertise in-house. So we've brought together design, user research, people who can think deeply about privacy and security, how we handle data, as Sarah is mentioning, um, and even people who have deep background and expertise in tech ethics, philosophy. And so we've, we've kind of brought these groups together to create a multidisciplinary team. And, and we used our team to go and augment you know, our engineering teams because we sometimes need to bring in those experts and just kind of in integrate directly with those teams. And the, you know, the important thing to realize is that you can't hire everyone. And so you have to have practices to enable more voices to be heard. And whether it's bringing in experts um, or even end users and stakeholders who are impacted by what you're building, you need to find ways for them to participate and actively co-create. And uh, recently we released a practice that we call community jury. And this is a way for stakeholders to hear directly from product teams and even co-create solutions to challenging problems. So as IT pros, I think it's important for you to start thinking about how you convene and bring together groups, where you actually insist on having groups being fully created to help empower teams, but then also finding mechanisms to bring in these additional voices that you don't really hire for, but that are a part of building product together. So with responsible AI, how do you make trade-offs? Benki, as a senior product leader, how do you balance between responsible AI uh, with AI investment and development? And how do you decide how to fit these things together? Oh my God, this is the best question because I think um, you know the, the, the heart of this uh, enterprise is to figure out how to do the trade-offs because I've seen opinions on, oh my God, I have the coolest technology, coolest data science that I've created that can do this thing. And you're like, really? You don't, you really want to do that? To on the other side, 
look, all this AI is unsafe because it's probabilistic and it's probably going to get wrong and we can't, we really should we should we even ship it, should we even make this product? I think you've sort of seen this entire spectrum. And so the, the you know, as my role is sort of really to figure out, you know, what is the right, um, um, sort of what, what is the right sort of path to get to? And so the principle that we have used in our team is uh, to really maximize learning. Sort of, you know, we're in very, very early stage of this, of this uh, sort of both an AI adoption and specifically understanding uh, responsible AI development and use. And so the, the, the techniques we're we mostly using is to figure out, look, there's probably a hundred things that are issues. And, you know, there might be 10 that are like, you know, uh, ship stoppers. Really, we cannot uh, ship without solving these problems. Otherwise, you know, you just, it's a face palm moment. So you, re you really have to sort of mitigate those up front. But then the next thing is there are like, you know, there's still 90 more issues, uh, but the question is how are you going to learn? And so we spend a lot of time thinking about what are the processes and technological ways in which we can sort of learn. So, you know, we've introduced gating for some of our services just so we can better understand what, what customers are trying to do with this AI, right? Because otherwise, if you're just a, uh, an open-ended service, people just open the API and start using it, and we have no idea what they're doing. And that's correct because we don't, we shouldn't see the customer uh, uh, data. But, but the thing is, we want to learn, and so we've introduced this new process, a new step in our system to explicitly ask people to sort of to opt in to say, use, use this, to use our service. Tell us more what you're trying to do. Why are you trying to do it? And that allows us to learn, and that allows us to build policies over time. And so the idea is to uh, sort of get, gain the learning. And as you do the learning, you sort of mitigate the issues that come from it, and then you start scaling safely. And so the idea is like, you know, you start with small, but then you sort of scale safely. And that's the, the process that we put in place in, uh, in cognitive services. So speaking of trade-offs, Josh, how do we decide who we are designing for and who we're not designing for? Yeah, it's a, it's a really, really important question and a really hard one, like Miro was saying, it's, it's not comfortable. You know, it's like not an easy conversation to describe who, if anybody, you're not designing for. You know, I think I haven't met anybody who gets into this industry because they want to exclude people, right? Um, and it's always easier for us to try to describe, you know, how inclusive or global we want our products to be. Um, but just like Venki was saying, like there's, there's a reality to prioritization. We've always been doing this, you know, uh, which features are we going to prioritize on what timeline for which markets um, using which which testing protocols, you know, and that last one, I mean, drawing from like a non AI field for a second, like that last one testing protocols, that's actually why sadly, like cars are less safe for women than they are for men. You know, somebody had to make a call at some point about a production requirement for crash test dummies, they had to figure out what is the body type that will best represent people so we can figure out how to keep them safest. But that call ended up being kind of this default male average body type. And the result is people are more hurt or people are exposed to harm. But AI is different. There's something different about AI. It doesn't have to be so rigid. It gives us this opportunity to learn for it to be teachable, just like Venki was talking about. And that comes with these new types of accountabilities. You know, in the past, we had to limit our logic to the code that we could write you know, the things that we could actually invent as rules. And with AI, we don't create the rules so much as we show examples, you know, of the outcomes that we're trying to make possible. So unless we've actually stated those goals outright, you know, who will this work well for? In what contexts? To get what jobs done? We kind of risk continuing on whatever is just the thing that goes without saying. Because everybody's different in different ways. But certain types of groups end up becoming kind of invisible or continuing to become invisible when it's too uncomfortable to talk about what makes us unique and what makes us distinct in our contexts and our characteristics. And then the stuff that goes without saying just goes without saying because we can't measure it. So this all sounds great. Sarah, can you tell us more about where you see challenges in uh, see challenges and tensions in implementing? Yeah, I think um, actually, thank you basically mentioned uh, a very significant one earlier, which is how do we balance um, privacy and, and, for example, in this case, in our case, customer data and customer privacy with our ability to learn and, and to debug, right, to understand uh, how is someone actually trying to use this? What are the real errors they're seeing? And so we've had to do a lot of actually, I think, you know, great innovation in figuring out how to build those feedback mechanisms so that people can report what they're seeing or they can they can share the information that they want to share. 
We also see a very similar tension with with privacy and fairness, where you know we don't want it feels as Josh was saying uncomfortable to call out specific groups to to have uh, you know someone's race particularly labeled in a data set, but it's very challenging for us to understand and build a test that tells us that it doesn't work well for that group of people if we don't have access to that data, if we don't have those labels. And so uh, there's a lot of tensions like that um, that we really have to to navigate. And I do think it's led to a lot of innovation. It's not just, well, it's only one or the other, right? That we have to go and design new mechanisms that allow us to really try to get the, the best of both. But uh, it's every day bringing all of these different perspectives there to figure out how to navigate these, these tensions and these trade-offs. And Venki, are there examples where we put this all together? Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, you know, we are just announcing at Ignite uh, sort of a new addition to our, uh, our vision product called Spatial Analysis. And that was sort of from the ground up uh, uh, built with responsible AI in mind. Uh, and so just to get started, like, you know, Spatial Analysis allows us for the first time for us to uh, use AI on moving images. So until now, our vision service mostly has been, work has been working just on static images. You give it a picture and it sort of tells you what's in it. Uh, it captions it. But now we're able to actually uh, look at a video feed and actually start making an, uh, do analysis and run AI on it. And so in uh, spatial analysis, we're able to sort of look at uh, space and sort of see, you know, figure out where people are, how close people are to each other. And this is sort of super timely uh, in the time of COVID because pe our customers are beginning to use things like spatial analysis to actually understand where people, how people are flowing through the system, uh, to, through their buildings, for instance, and then uh, find out where are their uh, choke points and so that people are not socially uh, uh, distancing. And so that's uh, an insight that they can use then later to sort of reconfigure the, the, the people movement flows in the, in the building. And so this is sort of really useful, but it opens up all kinds of questions about privacy and what, what can you see. And so uh, what's been great is as in the design, both from the data capture uh, all the way to consent for people to get into the models, uh, so for the data in the models, all the way to actually for the first time, we're actually sort of doing a, a, a great on, on release uh, responsible use guidelines. And so in our documentation, we have this great sort of uh, principle, uh, documentation on when can you use it? What have we done with it? How have we developed it? What is it good for? And then how should you as a IT pro and as a developer use this technology and where you should use it and where you should be worried about? Here are the questions that we want to ask you. So I think you know it really has been uh, our first example of end-to-end -end sort of um, from a life cycle perspective. So sort of looking at responsibly from the very beginning to the very sort of to, to release. And I think um, a key part of that has been transparency, right? Um, making sure that we are sharing the information um, that we uh, that we know as the model builder. Here's the limitations we know. Here's the, the things we know that would help you get higher accuracy. Uh, as people who have been thinking about this technology and uh, research that we've done with our customers, here's what uh, we have learned that, you know, uh, people react to or people want to see. Now, of course, that only goes so far, right? We don't know all of the deployment context and all of the information. And so uh, we it's just a step to empower customers to take their context into account and ask the right questions and make the, the appropriate decisions for their situation. And so uh, transparency is actually a key theme that we've seen kind of across the board. And so uh, one of the things that uh, we talked about a lot of build and, and something I'm very passionate about enabling this is tools. and. Uh, one of the reasons that we have um, built a lot of our responsible AI tools in the open source from the beginning is exactly to uh, enable this type of transparency. So you can understand exactly what the tool is doing and what it's not doing. Right? This is the fairness analysis the tool does. It's not magic. It doesn't do this other fairness analysis. Uh, and then also enable new people to come in and add new ideas and contribute and innovate more rapidly. But um, it's really important that people can really understand how the technology works and how the tool works to help them make the right decision in their context. And so uh, that's is one of our principles, but also just a, a really important approach that we're trying to bring to sort of every way that we build products and tools to uh, enable people like you to go and take the next step and, and use it responsibly. And, you know, as, um, as Sarah and Venki mentioned, it's uh, we're trying to be very transparent about our technology, but it also needs to be consumable with people and done in plain language, 
Um, our, what you'll notice with the documentation around spatial analysis is it's not our typical API type of documentation. You will see all of these perspectives coming in. We're sharing more about the customer scenarios and, um, and the guidance around you know, how do people think about these technologies? What are they concerned about? Um, how do you deploy it in accordance to the principles that we care about? Sarah mentioned some of our principles. Um, they include fairness and reliability and safety and privacy and security and inclusiveness, um, transparency, and also accountability. And the last thing we want to do is just throw technology out there um, without any sort of clear guidance or recommendations. And so this is where we're also proactively recommending how you address and disclose information about the system and the way it's working and doing it in a way that people feel informed and empowered to make choices to opt in or not. And so what you'll see in our, um, our documentation is just a lot of the um, deeper research that we've been doing as well and, uh, and using that to really empower IT pros to deploy things in a really responsible way. And, and we want you to have all that information. We don't want you to be in the dark and trying to figure out how to make choices. We want you to have all the knowledge that we have as well. And we're trying to be very transparent and, um, and humble about it at the same time. So yeah, I think, oh, sorry. Can I just add one more thing? Uh, I think the one thing that I would say, it has been a mindset shift for us in terms of uh, our APIs. Generally, you know, we always want to, as developers and everything else, want to say like, anyone can use it for anything. Uh, and, uh, and you know, we are really getting to the point where like, look, with AI, you just can't say like, well, it's just an API, just call it, and, you know, there's an output. Uh, there's a lot more uh, infrastructure and sort of, uh, sort of uh, help we need to put in to sort of make sure we support the right use of it. And so I think it has been quite a, quite a uh, change for us. And I think it'll be changed for all of you as well as you in, uh, implement it to think about all these extra things that previously, and so, you know, we've been struggling with like, is it a tax? Is it not a tax? Actually, well, it is new work, but it's super important work actually that sort of helped us long-term sort of really get adoption and people feeling safe with the technology. So I think it's sort of an important thing for us to learn. And I think it's important to recognize that it's not just easy. It is, it is work. And so I think you really have to go into that learning mindset and uh, lots of cool stuff will happen with it. So, so awesome that you know you, the efforts that you're put, putting forth to enable this. I wanted to ask of the panel, how long before it becomes just normal that this is a consideration as opposed to just adding on AIs in terms of technology, and it's just part of the design and build process that you're incorporating ethical use? That's a really good question. Um, how long before it's normal? We're going to push as hard as we can to make it normal as quickly as possible. And so this is where we, we are very um, proactive uh, about talking about responsible AI and all of the different types of disciplines and expertise you need to bring into the thinking. And so, um, you know, with any big shift, even if you look back to the way people, you know, shifted with security and privacy and accessibility, there is an early phase where, um, you know, we're all still figuring things out and we're trying to learn and understand. And then there's a part where you have enough critical mass where a lot of people are saying, okay, this is the way to do it. And so what we're trying to do is learn as quickly as possible and share that learning as quickly so that the industry is moving and shifting as, um, as rapidly as possible because this is, you know, a moment we're talking about AI, but it is a bigger question. It's a larger question about innovation all up and not just about AI, but about how we think about technology more holistically. And we're using this moment to facilitate that larger conversation. And I think um, as someone who's been working on this for a long time, I thought, you know, with any of these technologies, it takes a long time to make this kind of transformation, but it's actually been amazing to see how quickly uh, people have adopted and are just hungry for more. It's like, once you see this way of thinking, you can't unsee it. And so, our, our biggest challenge now is really building up those practices and the toolkits and really solving the hard problems so that all the people have a way to actually implement this and implement it at scale in all of these different uh, contexts. And so uh, I, it's been just incredibly encouraging how quickly people have you know, really adapted to thinking this way, but uh, we still have a really long way to go in terms of the, the innovation to enable this to ju just work in, in many different settings. Yeah, I can sort of at the total risk of dating myself, like, you know, in 2001, we had this sort of big moment with uh, with Microsoft around security. And I remember I was in a, uh, you know, I was a program manager there and we all these questions came up and we were just 
flummoxed. We were like, oh my God, how is anyone supposed to ever ship anything with so many requirements and so many unknown questions? And you know what? It took time, but we, you know, we'd learned, we built the tools and we, you know, we created this secure uh, development lifecycle. And now it just become how we do stuff. And it turns out not just it was good for security, it was just made better product. And I think that's to me the biggest uh, uh, thing for me is the, the, when we invest in this thing, it's not just that we are sort of solving some trust issues, we're actually just building better product and we just overall the thing is getting better. So because these are just right, the right questions to have. Uh, so I think, you know, for all of us as the industry, we're going to be working through it. But, you know, I, I expect, you know, we will innovate as usual and we'll sort of build tools and processes and policies and we'll sort of have the, this will all become sort of normal soon enough, as soon as possible, I guess. <laughs> So I want to thank everybody for being on the panel today. Uh, we took the, took the time to, to extend our, our session that we had at Ignite uh, to a full panel. IT professionals are now eager to learn more so that we can make ethical use of AI more normal. Where do we go? Thank you. Uh, yeah, great. Uh, we have an AKMS link for that. So it's called AKAMS slash RAI for Responsible AI, RAI Resource. I, I want to be a YouTube guy and say it's over here, over there. Uh, yep. It's down, down below. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's a great first place to start uh, in terms of your journey for understanding ethical use of AI. Uh, there's, I've gone through it a little bit already. There's great tutorials and there's great logic. And you know, a lot of conversations that happen within an organization from an IT's perspective, I heard a great quote yesterday. If I'm the equivalent of a mechanic with grease under my, my nails, how do I go then to the, the well-suited executive to explain why ethical AI is needed in, in, as best practice inside of an organization. And the, the content and the, the resources that are provided there are that talk track that can empower an IT professional to have that open dialogue with the executive uh, or the business decision maker we say at, at the organizations uh, to have that, that relevant dialogue with them in terms of why proper ethical use of AI is so important and it is inclusive of the world that we live in right now. So thank you all uh, for joining us today on the panel. Uh, and we're going to kick back uh, to Pierre. There we go. Mr. Roman. Oh, I can't hear you. Yeah, this was, uh, I was muted myself and I actually sat and, and watched. I, I it made me realize there's so many things in AI that I, that I take for granted. And I never realized that, uh, the, the, the potential bias that's like built into the models. So this was very informative and, and eye-opening. And how amazing, you know, specifically based on the IT professional's opportunity to build out this from the foundation to incorporate ethical use of AI in organizations as opposed to just tacking AI onto everything and, and not really being mindful of how we interact with people every day. That's right.